for all the CEOs and founders who are listening, on April 1st, we will start accepting applications for the 2023 class of the Seed Transformation Program. The 11-month intensive program will start in January, and it includes a combination of face-to-face teaching, networking, and virtual learning. You'll have the opportunity to participate in a cohort of 60 other like-minded entrepreneurs from across your region. Founders and CEOs of companies based in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia with annual revenue of at least $300,000 are eligible to apply. If you or a company you know may be interested, please visit stanfordseed.co forward slash apply to learn more. We started this podcast last year based on a simple premise that stories of entrepreneurs in India and Sub-Saharan Africa would be inspiring and instructive to a wide audience across emerging markets, but especially to entrepreneurs and those who dream of starting their own business. The world is awash in podcasts featuring the founders of billion dollar unicorns. And now those founders have their own podcasts. So if you want to know how Uber or eBay came to be, you can hear those origin stories over and over again. And frankly, they're becoming cliches, at least in my opinion. But what I could not find were many stories about people who started a successful $5 million or $3 million business in Ghana or Kenya or South Asia, about the unique challenges that they faced or the unique ways that they tackled problems that might seem routine here in Silicon Valley. What I've learned through my association with these incredible people is that the locus of innovation is rapidly shifting to these emerging markets, where a combination of necessity, untapped consumer demand, network penetration, and new technologies are leading to an explosion of business activity. And I learned that being an entrepreneur in these markets can be an incredibly lonely journey, and that they value the opportunity to network with each other and learn from each other. This podcast became a rewarding learning journey for me too. And so I wanted to take an opportunity to share some highlights from my conversations over the past year. So here it goes. As you can guess from the title of this podcast, an enduring theme of successful entrepreneurs is their grit and determination in the face of adversity. Author Angela Duckworth, who wrote an actual book called Grit, defines it as a personality trait combining perseverance and passion. Few people better exemplify these traits than Kwame Williams, the founder of Moringa Connect, which makes consumer products from the remarkable Moringa tree and sells them locally in Ghana, globally online, and even in some major U.S. retailers. So on January 1st, 2019, um, a wildfire that had already burned about a thousand acres of just woods jumped over our fire protection belt and and burned up 15,000 plus Moringa trees. There were unfortunately 25 miles per hour wind gusts that helped it do that. So day one, I'm like, okay, this is, this is not the plan. Fast forward four months in April, um, a fire accidentally starts in one of our dehydrators and unfortunately expands and, and burns down um, our factory. In October, our farm is nested at the intersection of two rivers and we're about 100 feet above the, the water level. The government's dam um, opened up and actually led to the water rising over 100 feet in a matter of hours and and flooding um, parts of our farm. One one of the things that's been amazing is is to acknowledge um, that life is hard, uh, right? The hardest punch is the one you don't see coming. I actually think we get too caught up in moments rather than in everyday choices. And so, For me, it's every single day that I wake up out of bed and just choose to try again. Um, It's every day that our farmers say, we're going to the farm and and we're going to take care of our trees. Uh, So much of how we've been able to uh, be resilient in 2019, not to even get to 2020, um, has been just a conscious choice by our entire team to take intentional steps intentional small steps one day at a time. Let's pause for a second and let's ask ourselves the five whys. Like, why is this happening? Um, What can we learn from it? Let's also pause and ask ourselves, um, what can we start, what can we stop, and what should continue? And we, once those ideas materialize, we just said, what is the smallest version of that that we can commit to and be consistent with? 
And that's been powerful for our entire team. It's been freeing for us. Um, it's helped us make intentional steps that have opened up incredible opportunities of growth uh, for the business. And it's also um, given us some amount of peace as we've had to make really, really hard decisions, painful decisions, um, as part of our resilience and recovery. So I get a call in the middle of the night, June 7th, night 2016, and it's my sales manager who happens to live on site at the factory. And um, I say to him, is everything okay? He says, no, the factory is on fire. So in a rush to the factory, which is about 25 kilometers away, and there's this eerie feeling, you know, as you're approaching, there's a smoke and there's a fire engines and there's a police. Faraz Ramji, who founded a snack food company in Kenya, faced a similar disaster when a fire destroyed their factory. Faraz found strength in the practice of mindfulness, something he now teaches full-time to other entrepreneurs. It's one of the things about mindfulness is I think a lot of people think it means, oh, you sit and meditate for an hour a day, and then you suddenly become some enlightened being. And, you know, you either don't have any more problems or you don't feel any more problems anymore. And it's just not like that. But I think for us in the business world, and not just the business world, for us in, in, in this society that we live in, which is highly volatile, unpredictable, complex, ambiguous, to use VUCA as the term, right? We're living in this world and we need a set of tools to navigate. Yeah, And mindfulness gives us those tools. So what I'm saying here is you use mindfulness in every moment. You choose to show up. Mindfulness is not just about sitting and feeling Zen. It's about showing up. I think this is where resilience really comes in. A friend of mine call, calls it psychological flexibility. And I wonder if we can call that yoga for the mind. Um, but basically, yeah, this, how do we explain failure or setback to ourselves? And we can take, say, either an optimistic style or a pessimistic style, right? And the pessimistic style being, let's say my revenues are down or my business is, is failing. This is permanent. This is going to last forever. It's all pervasive. And we tend to personalize. I'm a permanent failure and it, it filters into every area of my life. And maybe a healthier way would be take an optimistic explanatory style and say, okay, so let's look at this failure or this setback and say, what can I learn from this? Ah, maybe I could have done this better. You know, not sugarcoating things, taking the lessons right. where they're required, but also not over-personalizing things and yeah. not taking things as being all pervasive and permanent. Okay, you know, I can get over this or we can bounce back and do this better next time. One of the first questions I like to ask my guests is, what drove them? to the sometimes scary task of starting a business in the first place. Remember, Uber was originally conceived of as a limousine service, and Airbnb grew out of a few people trying to find a place to stay at a music festival. For our guests, I wondered, were they destined to start businesses? Was it an accident? Was necessity the mother of their inventions? The stereotype of an entrepreneur is a 20-something-year-old whiz kid who figures out something in his university dorm. It's not often, you know, the mid-30s married with a family on the way with a house and a mortgage. I certainly wasn't a born entrepreneur. I had to learn this. I worked for a company called De Beers, which is the largest diamond mining company in the world. It was a really interesting company to work for. It gave me some fantastic opportunities. You can imagine a young boy from Botswana, you get to London. It's fabulous. I went to most of the world's great cities, you know, New York, Miami, Toronto, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing, Dubai, you name it, we got to go there. At first, you're impressed. And then you start looking and saying, well, these places are great. These experiences I'm having are great. But what about my people? Who's going to build a London for my people? And after a while, it goes from being a great experience to not being so great because you realize that this isn't yours. Your people, people who look like you, don't get to have this. My vision is simple. I want to bring water, power, roads, rail to my people. And that's why I wake up every morning. That was Lorong Selawane from Botswana. 
he went on to build a multi-million dollar mining services company that trains and employs hundreds of people in the region. It's a business that is typically outsourced to international companies, but Laurent proved that it could be done locally. And now he's focused on developing the ecosystem in his country to support the next generation of entrepreneurs. By contrast, Lakita Madhukuri was dealing with a much more basic problem at her home in India. I never really wanted to be an entrepreneur. My mom was uh, uh, farming in our family lands and it was her hobby to grow uh, fresh produce. And she was getting all this produce back home and she was forcing us to eat all of it. We didn't want to eat everything that she was growing. So we drove down to like a supermarket next to our house and asked, would you stock organic produce? And he said, yes. And that's how Terra Greens came about to be. I love that it all started with you trying to get rid of some of the vegetables that your mom was putting on your plate. I think my, my kids would do exactly the same if they could figure <laughs> out a way to pull it off. And from that humble beginning, Terra Greens grew into a major producer and distributor of organic vegetables in and around Hyderabad. Still others seem born for entrepreneurship, like Arun Ayer, an InsurTech founder in Botswana. I was one of those people who has known nothing other than entrepreneurship my whole life. When I was nine years old, I grew up in a small town called Labatsi, just south of Khabaroni in Botswana. I used to read Fortune magazine, The Economist, and so on and so forth. You know, I read Warren Buffett's biography when I was 10. Uh, okay, that's weird. Can we just say it right now? That's weird. <laughs> it, it is weird. I, 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 I didn't think of it as being weird at the time, but it obviously was. And fortunately, you know, I had a very supportive family. When I was nine years old, I was dreaming about being an entrepreneur. And those dreams never went away. I'm now 38 and I still dream about entrepreneurship all day long, except now the dreams are a lot more real. We teach at Stanford that successful entrepreneurs rarely start with a solution and then go out and find the problem. They solve problems with a unique or better or cheaper solution than the competition. But from the perspective of emerging markets, some of the so-called problems solved by the fastest growing companies in the US can seem trivial. Can I get my fast food delivered to my doorstep even faster? Can I use my watch to get my Tesla to pick me up in front of the mall? Do I really need a toothbrush subscription? Don't get me wrong, I appreciate convenience just like anyone else, but that's a point. Conveniences, by definition, are not essential for life. So I'm struck by the urgency of problems that entrepreneurs are solving in emerging markets. Imagine if your problem was not information overload or what to believe on Facebook, but what is the fair price for my crops today? Not who has the best price for organic food, but rather, can I find food that's free of toxins? What about water that won't make my kids sick? Can I get emergency health care less than a full day's drive from home, assuming I even have access to transportation? It got me thinking that much of what we take for granted are really fundamental human rights. Access to food, water, basic health care, information. The phrase purpose and profit may seem overused, but these remarkable people are solving important problems as a business, not a charity. When I was in Delhi, I used to get a lot of these calls saying that, you know, somebody's sick, we are bringing him to Delhi. Can you reserve a bed for us in your hospital? Can you help us? So being the only doctor in the family, it felt very nice that, you know, I could help these people. I, I could solve their problems. Dr. Shuchan Bajaj was a well-established physician at a premier private hospital in India's capital. But on the other hand, it was always very troubling that, you know, why did these people have to travel four to five hours to reach me at the risk of losing their lives because ambulances were not easily available. But then I realized pulling them into my hospital didn't really work because even those who came were not really, you know, served exactly to what they needed. It was not like, even if they were saved, it was so expensive in these big private hospitals in Delhi that they would be, you know, that was even a bigger death if he did survive. So the whole focus shifted from how best to get them into hospitals in Delhi to how we could go out and serve these people without completely breaking them economically. So this is how the project started on how to best get good quality healthcare, which is not expensive, 
as near to the community as possible without asking them to travel four or five hours and asking them to sell their houses or lands. Because in India, 60 million people slip below the poverty line every year just due to healthcare costs. From that basic challenge, and with little formal business training, Shushan built a network of affordable yet sophisticated hospitals providing urgent care in secondary cities across India. He also built and staffed a 1,000-bed hospital in a matter of weeks during the darkest days of India's second pandemic wave, what he more aptly described as a tsunami. Sam Appenting is the founder of Joy Sam Ghana, which provides a host of services to bring drinking water to seven countries in Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, over 320 million people have no access to potable water. That tells you the scale of the problem. As we went more and more into the rural communities and saw the kind of deprivation and denials of decent living, then I began to realize that, look, we need to bring relief to people. We need to bring some comfort to those who are really deprived. Access to portable water in any community, what it means is that it has economic benefits, it has health benefits, and life generally becomes improved. People are just... When they have the fundamentals right, life begins for them. Sriram Gopal is the founder and CEO of Future Farms, which builds vertical hydroponic vegetable gardens at commercial scale in rural and urban areas across India. The main reason why we do this, and this is very close to me, because in India the standard of food is very, very low, because there are no mechanisms to check where the food comes from. It can be very, very uh, contaminated. In fact, there is a report that states that leafy green is four times more loaded with pesticides when compared to anything that is available in the developed world. There are alternatives. People can choose organic food, but they are paying like three times more. What it actually means is only people who can afford to pay three times more can actually have access to clean food. To me, that just feels wrong because I think clean food is not a privilege. If anything, it should be a fundamental right. Martin Stamella founded Brastorn Enterprises in Southern Africa to provide access to information for people with only the most basic phones and limited low bandwidth connectivity. For me, coming from a technology background and understanding how to build solutions for the top of the economic pyramid, because that's really the world that I lived in, and then moving into the development space and realizing that there's so many people who just don't have access. They just don't have access to the same technologies that we do, but the need is still the same. That really spoke to me. It struck a chord or how can we provide access, you know, and at the core, internet is such a luxury in some of these markets in Africa where we operate. How do we provide internet? And what is internet? Internet is just access to information, it's access to markets, and it's access to social communities. So how can we provide those for those people who don't have smartphones? So, you, I mean, the argument is almost that access to basic information in communities is, is a fundamental right, or we should think of it as a fundamental right. That's correct. I mean, I I think we are seeing that internet is a necessity rather than a nice to have. Africa has some of the most expensive prices for broadband. Mobile phone users is around 620, 650 million, and 77% of those use feature phones. So that means that they can't benefit from the opportunities of being connected to the internet. All these inspiring stories share a common thread. They are businesses solving important problems for individuals, B2C companies. But what about the problem of just doing business at all in some markets? Of merchants reaching customers beyond their neighborhood or securing working capital to finance inventory? Two of our guests took these challenges head on with technology-enabled B2B companies that may look familiar in well-developed markets, but are path-breaking in Africa. Juliet Anama, chairwoman of Jumia Africa and chief sustainability officer of the Jumia Group, took on the challenge of bringing access to markets for even the smallest informal businesses through the largest e-commerce platform on the continent. If you're a seller in Africa many years ago, you only had two options on how you're going to retail your products to consumers. Either you had 
to pay a very expensive high street real estate prices for a modern retail shop, or you had no other alternative but to operate in the open market, very informal open market is hot, it has no amenities or utilities and it's overcrowded. Those were the only options you had, especially if you were a small, medium enterprise just uh, trying to get by. So Jumia solves that problem for a host of millions of, of SMEs and sellers and merchants on the continent because you don't have to register on Jumia platform. Or you don't have upfront capital expenditure in terms of putting up retail space. Uh, literally minutes once you're registered and gone through the training for selling online on Jumia, you can start your business. But what I actually find extremely interesting is the number of women sellers that we have on Jumia. So we have, at least in Nigeria and Kenya, which are key markets, about 51% of our sellers are actually women. And why do women find it attractive? It's a gender agnostic environment. You could be a fashion seller, you could be an electronic seller, and you know you don't have a. It's not a physical market where someone can make those kinds of gender-related decisions or whether I want to buy an electronic product from a woman or not. So that is giving them access to different categories that they could perform in. Two, it is also giving women flexibility to be able to manage their homes and at the same time run a business of their own. Tunde Kehinde, co-founder and CEO of Nigerian fintech Lydia, is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to provide fast, short-term financing for SMEs, something traditional banks are unable or unwilling to do. We saw actually a bigger problem the businesses said, which is, look, when I have something that's working, I don't have access to the capital to scale it to the next level. Because in this part of the world and a lot of emerging markets, Because there's no real credit system where I have a credit score that can be uh, used to unlock mortgages, auto loans, etc., it means that to get a facility from a traditional lender, I need cash or land or machinery to back against that loan, which excludes 99% of businesses. And we said, look, we're now in a digital age and there's so much data. You can assess these customers and get them the capital they need to grow. The primary reason that Stanford Seed is committed to supporting the growth of businesses in emerging markets is the evidence that small and medium enterprises are the primary engine of job creation and prosperity, and not just in emerging markets. It's a commonly held belief here in the U.S. that Amazon and Walmart and a few other mega companies account for the lion's share of employment. But the truth is that 45% of U.S. GDP and 50% of all jobs still come from companies with less than 500 employees. And the data is even more striking for Sub-Saharan Africa, where more than 80% of jobs come from SMEs. And over the next 30 years, more Africans will enter the workforce than all other countries combined. Over the past year, we have seen power shifting to workers as they demand more flexibility, a living wage, and some reasonable benefits. Access to decent work is even more pressing in emerging markets, with high levels of unemployment, fewer worker protections, and striking inequality. The concept of decent work is enshrined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It means having an opportunity for work that pays a fair wage with some security in the workplace and the potential for advancement. Decent work can be particularly elusive for disenfranchised and marginalized people, for unskilled workers, and especially for women. And each decent job accrues benefits to everyone in the household, a multiplier effect that raises the standard of living for many. Linda Ampa, who built a garment and fashion company in Ghana, went to the streets to find employees, and in so doing, touched many more lives. In Ghana, in the marketplaces, there are women and girls who sleep on the streets. So we went out asking them whether they'll be interested to come and train. And the response we got was just amazing. You know, so we invited them over and then we started training them. Now, the challenge there was that because they didn't have a place to stay, they get um, raped, they have children. Very, very real stories of such women and girls. So we decided, you know what, we'll add housing to it. 
So we rented a place and then we give them the accommodation. So those who wanted to stay, they will come in, stay, finish their training. And usually after a year, they are able to rent their own place and then they move from the hostel. Currently, we have a girl who came to us through an NGO. She was picked off the street as a, I think maybe six or seven years old then. And as we speak now, this girl is able to do patterns. And for the garment industry, I find the pattern making as the most challenging. This girl is able to do patterns from scratch to finish. It's just amazing. Right now, the American embassy has decided to give her scholarship to come to fashion school in the U.S., We are very aware that giving somebody a skill and employing them in Ghana, the ripple effect, you're touching the lives of about six to ten people just by employing one person. Ankit Agarwal, who built a business recycling tons of discarded flowers from temples in India and turning them into a host of consumer products, started out by employing people at the very bottom of the social pyramid. When we started, at that point of time, we would struggle finding uh, people who would want to work with us, pick up flowers, segregate them. Uh, One day, these two women, uh, they came and they were very happy to work with us. This went on for a month. They happily completed all the work. I asked them what like motivates you to be here. So then they told me about the job that they were doing, that they were manual scavengers. They'll go home to home, pick up human excreta, keep it up on their heads and dispose it off. They said that no one ever gave them another option to work. They had to do this. And even their children will have to get into this. And when they started working with us, first of all, they don't have to go to home to home. They just have to come to a single workplace. That's one. Second, they felt good about themselves that they're working with temple flowers. And they felt that they're helping doing some God's work. And they'll help clean the river Ganges, which is a goddess. Another recurring theme from the last season was leadership. What it takes to bring your team through thick and thin to establish a strong culture and the importance of a clear and compelling mission. We heard earlier from Dr. Shushan Bajaj, who established an emergency COVID hospital at the peak of the Delta wave and at great personal risk. Yeah, I think the main thing is that they look to us for an example, right? So I need to uh, make sure that uh, I am there on the front lines as well. I am not just talking and saying that you need to do it, right? When we set up the thousand bed hospital, I was there. I admitted the first patient myself. So they do look it up as an example that, you know, if this guy is standing there, it must be safe. If this guy is standing himself and seeing all the patients and wearing the same kit as we've got, right? Even in vaccination, when vaccine hesitancy was there, the entire top management team, I think we were the first ones to go and say that, okay, now we are also getting vaccinated. So come and you should all get vaccinated yourself as well. So leading by example, I think, is an important part of the entire culture. As businesses grow, taking on new markets, new products, partners, and staff, they also become a lot more complex to manage for the founders. We heard in season one about the important role that governance plays in scaling business. The International Finance Corporation found that companies perform better over the long term after they have adopted strong governance practices. For some, that means creating a fiduciary board, a step that makes entrepreneurs nervous, nervous about losing control of the very thing that they built. Elo Ume, founder and CEO of Tarragon in Nigeria, offered a powerful counter argument. It might sound simplistic, but at its foundation, Good governance helps companies build accountability and trust. Trust with their employees, partners, and investors. I needed to get more comfortable with the idea of governance. Culturally in Tarragon, we throw ourselves in the deep. We take big challenges. And as a leader, I can't say I want to set up a board. And we set up a board of people who have been coming to have coffee with me in the office. It needs to be with people that when when my colleagues and co-founders look at the board, we set ourselves straight, right? I'm bringing in more people who I thought could drive performance and do all sorts of things, right? But I think that the board is there to do that, to do exactly that. And it's very, very important that you have a board not of friends because your friends will not tell you the truth. Fear of losing control can dissuade entrepreneurs from both establishing strong governance structures and seeking funds. 
So I wanted to dig in a little deeper with ALO about how key decisions are made in Tarragon. When it comes to approving budgets or key hires, auditing, does the board have the power? Yes, that's the case now, absolutely. But sincerely speaking, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that if you take somebody's money, I think it's a good idea to have transparency with audits. But forget about where the money comes from for a second. And let's talk about the entrepreneur control and the very nature of chasing a dream. If you have auditors and you have a board committee that the auditors report into, it doesn't stop you from dreaming. What it does is that it provides common sense to your dreams. And it helps you. Like I told my direct reports that you guys make my work harder, but I love you guys for it. Because the quality of interaction improves. And the decision-making of the CEO, which the CEO's job at the core of it is to make the best decisions. The quality of the decisions that to be made is enhanced 10x because of these dynamics. But in my experience, I don't feel that there's a handbrake on my ability to perform as CEO and entrepreneur in the Terragon business, pre fundraise and post fundraise There hasn't been that. In fact, I can argue that maybe my power, I now have a true appreciation for my position as CEO. The mother-daughter team of Naomi Kip Career and Annette Kimite, who lead the security company Sanaka East Africa, learned the hard way that a high-powered board can also lead to ruin without the right checks and balances. And they lacked the confidence to take a stand for what they knew was right. There's a time that we merged with a new pin company and we had an independent board and we had expertise in the board and we were represented in uh, so many countries, in Canada, in Europe, in Ireland. And when it came to the board, we were so naive because we were just learning a small family business that now was like almost swallowed by the big company from Ireland. So they came in and bought a majority share. You were minority owners, but you had no representation on the board. Me, Annette, and my husband, the three of us were in the board, but we were toothless. It was a very painful lesson, but a lesson we needed to learn all the same, because when we merged, we gave, we didn't even sell, we gave majority shareholding, and we took a step back, and some of us went to pursue other businesses. It started out very well. We started getting now high-profile clients. We had expatriates working with us. But what happened is not everything that works in Europe is a copy-paste, that you can just cut it and paste it in Africa, and particularly in even, uh, you know, even what we do in Kenya is not what we do in Uganda. The guards in Uganda we have are armed. In Kenya, they are not armed. So one of the mistakes we did was, as a board, is we didn't ask bold questions. We didn't give that governance element to be able to ask, is this the right solution for this market? So the European company didn't understand the local market, but you didn't feel that you had the voice or the stature to stop these guys in the board meeting and say, hey, wait a minute, this idea is not going to work in Kenya. Well, we tried to highlight it. We did papers, we did uh, comment. But again, what mom was mentioning was we, we either did not respect our positions as directors and probably took a backseat like employees giving a report, you know. So the results of all this was that the business ended up being overburdened financially. The partners from Europe, when they realized the debt was too much and what they owed the government, especially when it comes to taxes and and loans and auctioneers were coming on board, they just packed their bags. Literally, this is a funny story, but they packed their bags and resigned on an email and sold the shares at a very, very minimal amount. I'm happy to say that the family rescued their business once the foreign partners had left, and it is growing and thriving to this day. Another crucial ingredient for business growth is capital. We did a whole series of episodes in season one to explore how entrepreneurs in Africa and India raised capital at every stage of their business, from friends and family to angel investors to series A, series B, and beyond. Confidence, persistence, personality, they all played a role in their success and a recognition that fundraising is not a destination. It's an ongoing part of every founder's job. 
So we know that it takes time. We knew that it takes effort. And we knew that we have to tell a story. And really, at the seed stage, it doesn't matter what you already have. It matters what you want to build and how you're able to convince anyone of it. And you just have to be a good storyteller. Aditi Srivastava of Pocket Aces, a leading Indian digital entertainment company, takes the same approach in every funding round. So the advantage of starting early, and I tell all entrepreneurs, please start early. People are very shy to show their their product to others. I don't I don't know why, because I, when you have a minimum viable product, you should be extremely proud of it because that itself takes a humongous amount of effort, luck, all of that, right? We went very early to people and during our conversations, we started some revenue. So right. what happens is, You've gone to them at this point and say after a few months you're here, then you're here. This delta means a lot to people. If I had gone to them at this point, they would still think we were early. They always want to see the delta no matter where what your starting point is. Exactly. And that was key because even if we had gone to them with like $50,000 of revenue, who cares? It's $50,000 of revenue, right? But we went to them pre-revenue. So then even 50000 in like five months was like, oh, cool. So you've started monetizing, right? And then we launched another small channel and it was like, oh, cool. You've launched another channel. Just as entrepreneurs are trying to sell their vision, they're also selling themselves. Early stage investment, and I've actually heard this from a number of investors too. They said, look, when you're talking pre-seed round, you know, you're investing in the person. Who knows? The idea is a crapshoot, right? It's like a one in 100, it's a moonshot, whatever it is. But this person has something. And if this idea doesn't work, maybe the next idea is gonna work. Exactly. That was Arun Ayer, who we heard from earlier. He reminded me that it is just as important to make sure you have found the right investor because investing is not just about money. So he built up a relationship with Launch Africa founder, Zach George, long before they started talking about investment. So now even with, with VCs, what I do is I'm looking more at the type of person that I'm dealing with because really they're your partners. So even with Launch Africa, I had everybody around me giving me their opinion of Zach as a person, not as Launch Africa's GP or whatever the story is. I simply wanted to know, is this guy somebody that I can trust and I can partner with and we can take this journey together, whichever way it goes. The journey may go great, it may not go great, but the point is, you know, is this the kind of guy that I really can believe in and trust and who's gonna stick with me as we go through this? Aditi Srivastava of Pocket Aces takes the same approach in every funding round. So I think that's uh, one thing that maybe for other entrepreneurs, whoever will listen to this podcast, uh, I think it's important to kind of know that, you know, you're on it. You're always raising. We are in the market again. We're raising our next round. Again, you know, we're evaluating different types of investors based on our growth plans. Uh, we're also evaluating international investors, etc. So again, you know, you never stop raising. And it always takes time, no matter how big you are. Elo Ume of Tarragon goes a step further and notes the importance of investors and founders playing their respective roles. Venture is about risk-taking, right? And expecting outside success. So patience at the beginning is super, super important. Sometimes investors want to be entrepreneurs. While sometimes when an entrepreneur gets money from an investor, he kind of like starts to defer to an investor. And I have to say, initially, I made that mistake. But over time, I think I'm coming out of it. You need to continue to be an entrepreneur. That is what will get the business to where the business needs to be. And the investor needs to also respect how to be an investor. Governance, direction, providing support, a sound board, staying focused on the market and the opportunity. Those things investors are very good at. Financing is not the only path to growing a business. Adam Abate, co-founder of Ethiopian technology firm Apposite, describes the process of negotiating the acquisition of his company by Paga, a Nigerian fintech led by Tayo Oviosu. I think Tayo, you uh, articulated it for me. You said negotiations go like this, which means that you just got to keep pushing through it. I had the first conversation with Paga's board member and I listened quietly and I took it back to the guys 
And we were like, no, no, it's not going to work. Let's just write an email saying, <laughs> forget this. Let's do it this way. <laughs> and then I got a, we got a call from Tayo and said, hey, hold on, hold on. This is not how it works, you know? Let's keep going. And we talk, I don't know, once a week, once every two weeks. The picture could look very different from one week to the next in terms of how the deal was structured. In terms of advice to somebody considering it, the decision actually, as complicated as it sounds often boils down to a few principles. In fact, I think the reasons why you're selling should not be overcomplicated. But there, those few reasons would be very important. We mentioned some, you know, for example, as a company, why we sold, we wanted to focus, we wanted to have a, put all our energy in something really big. But also on a personal level, there were some principles. For example, I knew that Probably more than the others, my role could potentially have the most change. But at that particular point in time, I said, okay, this is the next level of growth for me personally. I want this challenge. That's, uh, I'm gonna, I want to push myself outside of my comfort zone. So that was an important consideration for me. Well, that wraps up our season one retrospective. I hope you found these vignettes as inspiring as I did. And if you haven't listened to the full episodes, check out the Grit and Growth Library on your podcast app. Today, we focus on our guest entrepreneur stories, but the full episodes include insights from Stanford faculty and global experts. And we have masterclass episodes that feature deep dives just with them on a wide range of important business topics. But before we go, I thought we'd end with one more inspiring snippet from Ella Ume. I think entrepreneurs need to know that they should have confidence in their journey. Sometimes that journey is... It's super lonely. Everybody's going to be against you. You know, those long and sleepless nights, your dream and your vision is valid. This has been Grit and Growth with the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'm your host, Darius Teeter. If you like this episode, leave us a review on your podcast app. It really helps us to share the stories of these incredible entrepreneurs with as many people as possible. To learn how Stanford Graduate School of Business is partnering with entrepreneurs in Africa and Asia, head over to the Stanford Seed website at seed.stanford.edu slash podcast. Grit and Growth is a podcast by Stanford Seed. Lori Fuller and Erica Amoake Ajay researched and developed content for this episode. Kendra Gladich is our production coordinator, and our executive producer is Tiffany Steves. With writing and production from Andrew Ganim, and sound design and mixing by Alex Bennett at Lower Street Media. Music